Welcome to WR1, a Blue Wire podcast presented by WinBet. I'm your host, Chris Carter, Pro Football Hall of Fame wide receiver. And today I'm talking to former Chicago Bears legendary wide receiver and arguably the greatest returner of all time, Devin Hester. The Florida native was drafted in the second round by the Chicago Bears in 2006. Devin immediately made an impact on the field for Chicago as a return specialist and contributed to the Bears' Super Bowl trip in 2007. He made Super Bowl history with the first touchdown return of an opening kickoff, the quickest touchdown scored, and the quickest ever lead taken by any team during Super Bowl 41. Voted 100 Greatest Chicago Bears of All Time, has now been nominated in his first year of eligibility to be inducted in the 2022 NFL Hall of Fame class. Stay tuned for my interview with former wide receiver, return specialist, Devin Hester. Welcome to Wide Receiver One, a Blue Wire podcast presented by WinBet. I'm your host, Chris Carter, Pro Football Hall of Fame wide receiver. And today we have one of the most electric football players in the history of this game. Former Chicago Bear, I'm not going to hold that against him, with, with me being a former <laughs> Viking, but truly one of the great returners that we've had, one of the great open field runners that we have. And I'm lucky um, to be able to host a podcast, but now to get one of the greatest returners ever, Devin Hester, formerly from the U, Chicago Bears, a couple other stops along the way. Welcome to Wide Receiver One. Appreciate it, Chris. Man, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure when you, you know you get an opportunity to speak to a legend. And uh, I admire you, and I love the game that you, the way you played it. And uh, I'm just just grateful to be on your show today. Man. Well, thank you. This show is all about you and your journey to where you are, um, where it started. Um, talk about some of the special highlights along the way, um, what you're currently doing. But I've been knowing you for a long time. And it was brought to my attention because I've been living in South Florida close to 30 years that there was a kid outside of West Palm Beach in high school football. He's one of the fastest football players they had ever seen. Can you kind of describe um, your upbringing in football, uh, the people that might have been important to you and the area where you grew up and the type of talent um, that's in that area and how football was a little bit different in South Florida? Football, man, people don't realize when, you, when you're born and raised in Florida, man, this is one of the most popular uh, sports that we play. When you got up north, you got a lot of basketball players. But when you talk about the Sunshine State, um, back in the days, I don't know how it is now, but back in the days, the top colleges would get all these skilled players from Florida and all the fat boys from up north. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's pretty much how it was back in the days. I don't know how it is now, but... Mm-hmm. Um, just to mention, to pick it back off what you said, some of the guys um, that mentored me growing up. Um, I grew up in a, a town called West Palm Beach, um, and uh, we had some great athletes come out of there. Anquan, yes. um, Vince Wolford, Patrick Peterson, man, I, the list goes on. But um, I had a lot of guys. It started off in Boys Real Club. Um, that's something that down south has a lot of Boys Real Club. So after school, there was, it's like a program you go to mm-hmm. where you have parents – I mean, get off work at 7, 8 o'clock at night. So this is an opportunity for kids to stay out the streets, you know, and to give them something to do. Mm-hmm. So um, I love going to the Board Club, and um, that's where I went out to school. And I had a guy by the name of Mr. Thompson, uh, which was like the sports director of the Board Club. And um, kind of he – I met Mr. Thompson at the age of about seven. And um, he just was one of my biggest mentors, mm-hmm. man, from just sports here. And then, you know, you go on, you got, I got an older brother that uh, just pushed me a lot and, and always motivated me. So those would probably be my top two right now that um, just inspired me to play sports and what got me involved into it. Now, Devin, you made it to the pinnacle uh, as far as athletics, being a great player, playing the great franchise, playing in the Super Bowl. But it didn't start off that way. You know, when you look on your past, man, as a, a young person – if you look at all the news with athletes and mental health and um, you saw the receiver for Atlanta, that he's going to take some time off Ridley um, for mental health and, and uh, uh, Lance Johnson, uh, Philadelphia, the right tackle. He took a few weeks off and there's so much more attention on it. But 
you've been dealing with mental health since you were a kid. Kind of go into the story because I know you tragically lost your dad. So mental health has been something you've been working on for a long time. So uh, growing up, um, again, you know what I mean? A a lot of Florida uh, activity goes on and, um, you know, a lot of people get caught up in the streets. And my dad was one of the ones that um, got caught up in the streets at a young age. So I really didn't know my father until I was about in first grade. And um, so he, when I was born, well, the piggyback of my mom and my dad started dating when she was in high school. So my mom um, ended up moving out of my, my grandmother's house at the age of, I want to say, in the 10th grade. My mom had her own apartment in high school and when she was in, the, in her 10th grade year. And had my brother when she was in 11th grade. And so my mom was in a situation where my father uh, was in and out mm-hmm. and uh, she ended up getting, she, so she had my brother in 11th grade and she was on her own and she was with my father and uh, ended up getting pregnant with me in the 12th grade. So she, I walked across the stage with my mom when she graduated. I was in her belly. <laughs> but uh, my father, um, when I was born, he, uh, got caught up in the streets and I uh, I don't remember seeing my father when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ended up going to prison and um, I think I went to prison maybe once or twice to visit him and so uh, the next time I seen my father I had to be in the first grade and um, I actually ran from him um, you know because I was just scared. He came and showed up at my school you know what I mean so I'm a kid. I Seen him once, and this is my father. I maybe seen one or two pictures of him. And uh, first time I see him, actually, where I knew who he was from pictures was showed up at my school, and I uh, was coming to pick me up. Mm-hmm. And I took off running with my teacher. Uh, like, this is your father. He says, come to get you. And I seen him. My eyes got big. I was starstruck. I took off to my brother's classroom and told him, hey, daddy's here. He's been a kidnapper. You know, that's my first time. That's my first time seeing my father in my whole life. The first thing I said, I took off running from him. Told when my brother told my brother, my dad is here. He's finna kidnap her. So from that point on, you know, uh, when he got out, we started building a relationship with my father. You know, and um, a couple of years later, my mom got in a real bad accident, and so uh, she was. Uh, they had to cut the car in half. She was almost paralyzed. She had his plates from back of her neck all the way down to to her skull, and. Um, she was airlifted, you know what I mean, from the accident where they took her in a helicopter and rushed her to the hospital. It was one of the most dead. When you see the car crash and you see the car and have the pictures of the car, you would say it's nobody in the car that was able to make it out. And uh, she lucky she made it out and she lived. And uh, from that point on, you know, good relationship with my father for about three years. And, um, after three or four years, he ended up dying. dying. And so uh, from that point on, I had to deal with that situation with my mom. She was still recovering from the injury. But the injury, um, recovery from her injury lasted almost three and a half, four years to the where she was completely healthy. You know, like it was, I can remember as a kid, um, when she came home from the hospital, she couldn't get out of the bed on her own. Um, she couldn't go to the bathroom on her own. She couldn't sit down. She just laid in the bed for almost two years. You know, the injury was that bad. And um, she would, like, I can remember seeing my mama cry trying to make it to the bathroom because her body was just so badly, just bruised and neck and, almost, you know, just it was just terrible. So I, I, I had to go through that as a young kid, you know, and then the way the when I left that house, I was seeing my mama like that and going to school, it kind of relieved a lot of pressure from me and then going to the club and to be able to be around guys and, and to run and grab a basketball and go play football. It kind of relieved the stress that I had to deal with when I know it's time to go back to the house. Um, So that that was the passion and the drive that said, you know, I mean, this could be a way of, you know, watching NFL players and seeing how they're able to take care of their parents and get them in a better situation that if I can make it out, I can make my mom life a lot easier, you know what I mean, where she's not stressing and stuff like that. So that really, really motivated me to continue to do what I do and stay stay out of trouble and continue to stay in school and, and hopefully better myself as a person and as a player. Right. 
Now, for you, given all the things that you went through as a youth, um, I can relate to that. My mom had my oldest brother when she was 16 and went on to have seven kids before she was 25. My father wasn't a part of my life. So I understand that hunger and desire to do something for people and get them out of the situation. But you weren't out of the woods because not only you struggling with mental health, and everything going around your family academically, right. you still right. needed some help uh, there at the end. And, and I remember this. I remember reading the papers and everything, you know, with you really trying to make sure that you were able to play for the University of Miami. Right. Now, I didn't even know the story behind it. But yeah. how would you like to encourage young people as far as there really are no excuses in life because you could have given up. But you kept right. fighting for your dream, and you got that scholarship to the University of Miami. Yeah, so I was uh, pretty much was offered a scholarship, I would say, after my end of my sophomore year, mm-hmm. junior year in high school is when Miami pretty much offered me. Um, it, it came from, I don't know if a lot of people knew, but back in the days when Miami had that Nike camp, it's yes. not as big as but back in the day when Ni- Miami had a Nike camp, it was only selected by the juniors going into their senior year. And so I had a friend of mine. He was going into his senior year, and I was going into my junior year. So you was only invited if you were going from your junior year to your senior year. So I was invited. He was invited to go, but I wanted to see it because I knew all the best athletes all over the world was there. And so – um I got in line with him. He was when we showed up at the University of Miami. I got in line with him. He was getting his his shirt. They had a Nike shirt with his name on it, and they passed it to him. And I was right behind him, so they looked at me and they're like, "Are you on the list?" And I was like, "No, I'm not on the list." And they were like, "Well, here, come on, we're getting late." So they, hey, what's your name? We don't have any. Like, I told him my name was Devin Hester, and they wrote Hester on the shirt and gave it to me. So I'm like, "Wow, I'm finna sneak in this camp," <laughs> you know what I mean? and so. I uh, ended up sneaking into the camp and participating in all the drills. And so by 15, 20 minutes in the drills, I start, you know, making plays. And then everybody started talking, who is this kid right here, Hester? And so we do the 40-yard dash. I run the fastest 40-yard dash. They're like, wow, this kid ran four. I ran 4-3-3, fastest 40-yard dash, 40 yards. And the Nike count, four, three, three. I said, wow. So you got to keep an eye on this kid. So they end up doing some of the drills. And it got to the point where could nobody stick me to where they had to put two people on me <laughs> doing the drills. Mm-hmm. And I was still killing them. So they're like, wow, this kid is unbelievable. And I know they win the MVP of the camp. And they didn't realize that I was going into my junior year until after they gave me the MVP. And they were like, oh, yo. So that's when I got offered the scholarship to mine. But to go back and forth with that that situation, um, academic wise, academic wise was, I took my SAT scores my junior year, mm-hmm. right, and got my schools back. Had qualified, had a GPA of close to three point oh, and I scored like a high nine nine sixty nine seven. So I was qualified. So as a true athlete, that's right there. That's the only hump that a lot of these kids from Florida struggle with. It's the great situation of having the SAT scores out of ACT scores. Mm-hmm. That's where a lot of them fall short. I took all, I had all that done my junior year, right? So my whole senior year, all I had to do was maintain my GPA and just focus on football and make sure I didn't get any injuries, key injuries. So, and I did that. Um, went on to Miami, um, checked in my dorm rooms with all the all, all the recruits, and. Um, the first day of practice come and as I'm getting ready to walk out of my room, one of the guidance counselors come to me and he say, hey, Devin, we got an incident going on. And he's like, there's nothing to be worried about. You you good. And we just going to clear up some stuff in there. So he's like, come down to you know, the facility with me and we'll talk it over. We get down there and I meet with the act, uh, sports director and he says, um, we have an incident of um, your SAT scores. And I'm like, so what's the problem? And he's like, yeah, it's been, they called us and, and said that we had several phone calls, you know, re- regarding the SAT score. They said it's been a couple of colleges calling 
and two or three people called about the incident. So they said since it's more than one, you know, contact calling us, it, it, it must be going something going on. So I'm like, okay. So we we get to the find out the results. They said that um, your SAT scores match somebody else, the guy that was sitting right beside you. And so I was like, well, what are you trying to say? And it's like, well, your answer match his answer. I said, well, what did he get? And his score was lower than mine. And my, I think he had, he scored, I think they said like a, a 850 or 870. And I had like in the high nines. And I would say, well, if I was a teacher, right? Mm-hmm. And it's two kids sitting beside each other. And one guy has an A on the test and one has a B, but they all matches. I'm assuming that the guy that has a B <laughs> yeah. is the guy that has an A. <laughs> right. So if, if you don't have a preconceived idea that this athlete right. compares to this other person, yeah, yeah that makes right. sense. So I'm like, for, 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 for one, when you get, when you question your, when your SAT scores get questioned, they don't give it back to you. They sent you a letter in the mail mm-hmm. and said, we found some suspicious stuff going on with these two scores. So we're not going to give you back to your test. We're going to question it and investigate it a little bit more. And if we find something, we'll just have you retake it. And I said, well, why did y'all, if y'all had any questions, I would have loved to take it over again. Why did you wait a whole year? Mm-hmm. You know, a year and a half, I took my junior year, beginning of my junior year. I took it my beginning of my junior year. So I went my whole junior year and my senior year where I had to run by no test scores, no nothing. Just play football. And then you wait till I get to college and you and, and, and you guys are able to do that. Like, it's not fair. Like, so I had to sit out. Mm-hmm. It was like Miami said that we didn't want to take a chance because they could have said, you know what? We're going to disregard it. It was really up to the University of Miami to say, yes, this is something. I remember crap. Y'all don't have y'all don't have proof. If anything, he this guy is cheating on Devin's chest because Devin's chest is, is higher than here. Y'all don't have no proof. So I had to sit out a whole year of not playing no football, and then the next year they're like, you can you can come back and play football, and that was it. So I'm like, you just made me sit out a whole year. I don't have to take no test or nothing. Just sit out a whole year and just don't play no football, and then you come back next year, and it, and it, everything is resolved. I'm like, what sense does that make? And so I had. Maybe like 15 other colleges called me like that is BS. Miami didn't want to take the chance of just mm-hmm. allow me to play. And then three week, three or four weeks later into the season, it get blown up again. And then they lose out. And they didn't ask for the bowl game. And so I had to sit out a whole year. Like I said, I had 15 other colleges saying, listen, we want them. Right. We'll take them right now. And he'll be able to play on our team right now. But my mom, she's like, no, nah, we're going to stick it out and stay with Miami. And that's how that story ended, man. Right. I'm glad you told that story because, you know, it's about perseverance and it's about still following your dream. Even after what you went through the Miami, had a great career at the University of Miami, scored many touchdowns, many different types of ways. Um, was drafted in the second round by the Chicago Bears. And the reason why I have to move ahead to that is because I want to read something to you. Okay. 57th pick overall to the Bears in the 2006 draft. Went on to be three-time first-team All-Pro, one-time second-team All-Pro, four Pro Bowls, three times NFL Alumni Special Teams Player of the Year, NFL 2000 All-Decade Team, NFL 2010 All-Decade Team. There's only a handful of people that made two All-Decade Teams in the history of this game. The biggest award, the NFL's 100th anniversary all-time team. And just a side note, the Brian Piccolo Award in 2006 there with the Bears and also gracing one of the the Bears' all-time great players, 100 all-time great players. Talk to me about your pro career. And I want to take you to the night, your rookie year, back in your home state of Florida. Prince is getting ready to perform at halftime. It's raining a drizzle. They decide to kick the ball to the most dangerous guy in the history of the game. It's the end of your rookie year. Walk me through it. Oh, man, that, that whole season going up, my like you said, my rookie year, and defense, offense played. 
I would say nah, offense okay with defense and special teams. Don't, 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 don't. Hey, now listen, <laughs> this is my podcast. Okay, you, so you, whole oh, oh. Thing was good. lights out football, man. Just Thank killing you. everybody. Man. Yeah, and your quarterback was was slinging it. Rex Grossman. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my very 67 yard touchdowns, man. And we happened to make it to the Super Bowl, man. Mm-hmm. My first time ever on the, on the football team. Like, that's that's unbelievable. You know what I mean? When you, as a rookie, you get the opportunity to make it to the, the Super Bowl your rookie year, that's, you got to treasure that because you can have a guy play 15, 20 years and never make it to the Super Bowl. But to narrow it down to that, that Super Bowl, man, and I'll get an opportunity to be able to come finish college and then go right back there and play in the Super Bowl and to be able to practice at our, we practice at our facility, at Universal Mind Facility. So me walking around there was an honor and to know that I was on the Super Bowl team. But to go to that night, Marin, and um, to lead up to that night where you have, you're reading the paper, your first team coach telling you, man, Tony Dungeon is saying they're not going to kick it to you today. Then Thursday coming around, they decided the team, Told them that they 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 want to kick it to you, so they're gonna kick it to you. And then leading up to a Saturday night, mm. they changed the mind and it's just back and forth, <laughs> back and forth. And so uh, the night of the game, my coach uh, Coach Dave told, which is the best best team coach in the NFL. He I guess he got a hold of the paper and they said we gonna give it to him. We gonna try out because we feel our best team better than theirs. And so uh, pretty much that night, man, standing there, man, with a little rain drizzling on me. You know, it's South Florida, so it's gonna rain a little bit. It was drizzling a little bit, and uh, I'm standing there like in my hometown, like wow, just looking up in the stands, and you see all the camera lights flashing and stuff. And I'm like, man, after everything I went through, man, who wouldn't have known I would be standing mm. right here? Wow, in my hometown, my first year, man, like wow, and getting ready to be the first one to touch the ball in the Super Bowl, mm. like that. People don't realize that me in my hometown, man, my first. Time in the in the NFL, and I'm standing right here on the biggest stage, the biggest game of national football, which is the Super Bowl, and I'm gonna be the first one to touch the ball. They do kick it to me. They do kick it to me, man. Straight that band up, cause we about to get jiggy. (laughs) And still love, man. Me. Were you were you bringing it out regardless of where it was landing? Oh yeah. <laughs> listen, my coach gave me the green light. Okay. He said, hey, yes. He said, "Listen, Dev, you you earned my respect. You earned my trust. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go with whatever decision you make. If you want to bring it up, you bring it up. And as a rookie, man, it's hard to gain trust like that in your first year. You know what I mean? So your coach like, listen, man, we play by this. This is what we're gonna do. If they do that, you do this. He's like, listen, I'm right, we should be trusting you." And man, sure enough, he kicked that ball, blooped up, and I said, "Oh my God, I ain't even got rid by breaking this one now. It's already short." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and you know, I dealt through the hole and got up on the kick, and I said, "I can't believe this is really happening. I cannot believe this is really happening." I look up at the drummer trying to scream, and I don't see nobody in sight. I'm like, "Oh my God, look at this mirror! Wow!" Now, did you always know? that you were going to be a great open field runner because people tried you on defense. People tried mm-hmm. you at wide receiver. I was like, man, let me coach him. I, I can yes. turn him into something. Or even yeah. like the modern day game, they throw the ball sideways so much, you know, wishing that, man, you could have been playing a, 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 a little bit later. Or was there something just about that open field? Because, man, you got to be courageous to return yeah. kicks, kickoffs and punts. But yeah. what was it that you have that normal people don't have? It's just, and, and Chris, we all know this, right? So I look at myself as just an athlete, right? Mm-hmm. You have certain players on the field where you say, man, this boy, he's been playing since he was two. And then you have guys you look at and say, yeah, he started playing when he was in his 11th, 12th grade. Yeah. It's just the way you move. And we all know football. With people that really know football, you can look at the player and it don't take one or two minutes to know that that boy that's been playing since he was four or five years old. That's the type of player. I can, I can do anything. I was always like that since a young kid. Every part one of the team I played on, I played four or five positions. And so it was so hard for a coach to say, we're just going to put him here. 
Cause we, I was that type of player you can put me in. But when we played Tulsa football, mm-hmm. Tulsa football, sometimes I would just have to get a ball up because I get tired of running back and forth scoring touchdowns. <laughs> and just, Tulsa football is you. He tossed the ball up mm-hmm. and it's you against everybody out there. And sometimes I would get tired, get tired out of running about four, five on back. I said, man, here, somebody else turn. I just had that knack for just returning and just mm-hmm. ball skills. And that's why I'm in a situation where I ended my career because it was just coaches didn't, wherever you put me, you know what I mean? It was just the other offensive side or defense side was mad because they didn't have me. Now, throughout your career, I mean, you have a handful of plays that, you know, anytime NFL film plays the the, the greatest returns and everything, they're going to be on there. But give right. me just a, a few examples of plays that were your favorite plays throughout your journey in the NFL? I would say my my first opportunity playing receiver. You know, my first opportunity really, really throwing me out there receiver. Like I said, people don't realize I never really played receiver, though. So I was always a running back, cornerback. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and if you wanted, if your team, if they wanted to go deep, they would go out there and run a fly. You know what I mean? They're running hits. They got a corner out there that's just playing on the island. They're just going to run one step hit. Like, I was never really taught the proper wide receiver. I never played wide receiver. So, when teams stopped kicking the ball to me, that's when Coach Lovett came to me and said, hey, man, listen, I know how you're feeling about this cornerback situation. But right now, hands down, right now, if they had to pick two guys that's the most electrified players in the NFL right now with the ball in their hand, you would be one of the two. And since they're taking that game away from you by not kicking you the ball, I have to move you to offense. That's the only way you can touch the ball. And that's why mm-hmm. I got moved to wide receiver. Because the team started kicking to me after my first year. Right. And they're like, listen, you're the best person on our team with the ball in your hand. We have to find a way to get the ball in your hand. So, like I said, I didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, but I, I told them, like, listen, man, you the coach, I'm the player, I'm a team player. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever yep. it takes to win. Now, you know what I mean? So yep. I, I knew that story behind it. I knew you never wanted to play wide receiver. That was also one of the reasons yeah. why I wanted to have you on this podcast because you were a special, special player that defied any position. Right. <laughs> well, wide receiver was the one I did not want to play. I, I, I love playing cornerback. Like, that was my passion was cornerback. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. in high school, I came out of high school rated number one corner in the nation. People don't know that. I was the number one corner in the nation coming out of high school. That was my passion, but I was just so gifted with the ball in my hand until I played running back in high mm-hmm. school. And, and the offense just, oh, my God, this guy is good. But running back was my passion. I meant cornerback was my passion, man. I was just forced to do it. And I said, you know what? I'm a team ball player. I'm going to do it. And growing up, there were a lot of people that could be role models for you. But mm-hmm. I know uh, you picked a couple guys that I know and uh-huh. really developed a relationship. I know Michael right. Irvin's one of your favorite, but your all-time right. favorite is primetime Deion Sanders. Right. And yeah. I know he's had a significant impact on you on and off the field. And right. I have seen you many a days, too, um, kind of make a play and uh-huh. even kind of have a salute or a tribute. To, to, to oh, prime yeah. time, even before the play is or a tribute to, to, to prime oh, yeah, well, is over with. So kind of I know you grew up a Cowboys fan, but kind of de- describe, you know, kind of growing up and being mentored by some of the, the greatest players. Yeah, that like we've ever you had. say, man, Dion was probably the, the number one player that that I idolized. Like every kid grew up that loves football always had that one player. They say, man, everything I'm do, I'm going to do just like him. The way he dressed, the way he walked, the way he talked, the way he put on his uniform, what kind of helmet, what kind of face mask he got. I'm going to get that's right. Just, <laughs> right. Does he, he wear a shield? shield? <laughs> Do he wear a Dion face mask? Do he leave one chin strap loose? Like, that's what I So Dion was that guy. My first mm. my first play in Pop One, I took a pick back. First play of the game. First time putting on pads in Pop One. First play of the game. First play of the game. Pick six. I high step back. 40 yard line mm. from the fourth one down. <laughs> That's how much I idolized Deion Sanders. So he was just that guy, man, that just mentored me. Um, we started in college where I got introduced to him. And 
um, mm -hmm. we have shared conversation like we text this morning. Like we we text every morning. And we have been sharing this that mm -hmm. conversation since my sophomore year in college to to, to this day. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, very few people. I know I know mm -hmm. who Prime is. And a lot of people, I don't feel, get to know the right. real Prime. Um, I believe that he's going to be a great oh, yeah. college coach. I believe he's going to keep ascending in the college ranks. And there are going to be many a kids that are going to get that personal right. touch that, that you came to know um, and still are getting uh, now. Um even as as you approach the age where you're mentoring kids, like like right, he mentored you, so it's it's like I'm really, really, really like I utilize and respect him so much, and every step that he take, man, I feel myself in that same pattern. Like right now, I'm coaching youth football, and I have a son, just like I have three boys, three boys just like him, and I'm coaching them right now on the youth football team. We actually got a playoff game this week, and so man, like. What he has done, not only for me, but for this community, for the, the younger kids that's growing up, the op giving them opportunities, man. Everything that he does, man, is always successful and it's always good for the, for the youth. Now, this offseason, the NFL came up with the list for the finalists for the 2000. And 22 Pro Football right. Hall of Fame. And lo and behold, it's been five years since you retired. And guess who, as a first-timer, is on the list? That is Devin Hester. First of all, give me where you were when you heard the news. And secondly, give me what type of emotions, you know, went through your, through your mind. Um. Wow. You know what I mean? It... Okay. <laughs> okay. Listen, man, Take a it's... breath. That's what I'm talking it's, about, it's, man. It's, Just it's slow down. players that like football. And those that love it. The ones that love it, you understand where I'm coming from. The ones that love it. It's they love it because of where they, where they came from and what they had to do to get to it. Mm. So for me to go through what I went through and to leave college and, and the coach is telling me, man, you're not going to be nothing but a kickoff and punt return if you leave. And the struggles that I had my junior year where I was benched because I was getting too much success. Like, people don't know those type of stories, you know what I mean, that I had from, 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 from yeah. a baby coming out of my womb, man. I was struggling. You know what I mean? Yep. So to get to this point where right now the Hall of Fame is great, but to even be announced for me is an honor. Even just be in mm -hmm. the category saying you 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 a first you a potential first ballot. Like we're not even talking about you making it, but for me to be on that list, man, like I feel like my, my career is I'm 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 happy with it. Now if I make this Hall of Fame. You know what I mean? Like, I get on most so emotional because I can get talked about this since my rookie year, Chris. Like they don't fuck this up since my rookie mm -hmm. year. What you did your rookie year is Hall of Fame worthy. So it ain't like my last couple of years of the NFL where they be mentioned, oh you you're looking at your stats now, man. You might have a chance of making the Hall of Fame. I've been getting these talks in my rookie year. And guess what? I continue to put in that work. Regardless of what they said, I continue to put it down on the field, man. I continue. Like, some people would shut it down and say, wow, I'm already in the race for the Hall of Fame my rookie year. I'm going to coach through these years, my, my years in the NFL, and be happy. I got talk. I was getting talked about the, the stats that I had my rookie year was already getting brought up. Oh, you Hall of Fame. Well, you look like you're going to make the Hall of Fame. And I continue to work hard. Because I know, like, man, Life is not that long, and the NFL is not that long. So whatever time you win it, you better put it down, man. And that name on the back of your, your shirt, it don't not only represents you, but it represents them little ones that's walking around with pissy diapers, that wife that's in the kitchen cooking that meal, your mama the one that struggled when she was in high school and had to get her own apartment in the mm -hmm. 10th grade, that had a kid in the 11th grade, 
And then with Fred, with me walking across the stage and staying in the house by herself and told me what she used to eat for lunch. Man, come on, man. That, that, the Hall of Fame, man, that, that right there put a stamp on everything, man. Everything. And I need to make that Hall of Fame. It ain't that I want to make it. I'm going to make it. No, you can talk about it, man. I understand. I was one of the players. I was verbal about it. I, want I wanted it. it. I, I'm, I'm never and ashamed of it. Not, I'm, and, I want first ballot. I want first ballot. Mm. I'm not talking four, five, six, seven years from now. I want first ballot. I feel like you put in the work and you deserve it, and you are the number one returner of all time. What's the question? The number one quarterback of all time is a Hall of Fame. The number one receiver of all, of, of all time is a Hall of Fame. The number one running back is a Hall of Fame. It's time to start putting these special teams boys in because at the end of the day, we win games too. You don't think when I play the game plan was, listen, if we start them else and we can win this game? Good. Let's talk about that because not only yourself, but Steve Tasker, he's been on the list for a number of years, and I'm glad that right. you brought it up. Um, I've become very good friends with Morton Anderson, who several years ago got into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I've become um, decent friends with Ray Guy, who several years ago finally got into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So we don't have a complete team in the Hall of Fame right. yet. We need, to, we need to start acknowledging the people that ran down there and set up great field position so your team can win because it's the ultimate team game. And the guys that make a difference. So I don't have to get two or three extra right. first downs. So we might start in the red zone. We might start the game with a lead. Mm -hmm. And also fear. Teams kicking the balls. Hey, man, we'll give it to them on the 35. Okay. We'll take that. So you're kind of one of the spokespeople to be able to usher in right. that group. And I, like I say, not only does the returns and the touchdowns um, is what everybody looking at. You got to look at field position, man. Right? Yeah, point has come up mm -hmm. several times, man, throughout the week during pregame warm up. Man, I gotta keep the ball twenty yards out of bounds. You finna mess my stats up. I was averaging forty eight <laughs> yards a punt. I was averaging fifty four yards a punt. Now I'm finna drop my stats because I don't have no choice. I had to kick it out of bounds. Field position, shame. Ed, me, and you play football. Field position is the key. You get great field position every time. You should Absolutely. put up. It's a one first down is a first. One first down is a field goal. With great field position. Mm -hmm. So, in my situation, man, like, I look at Hall of Fame, though, when you look at those guys at Hall of Fame, you say, what do they all have in common? Dangerous players on the field. Key players on the field. Players where mm -hmm. the other coaches yeah. on the opponent coaches have to sleep all the night dreaming mm -hmm. about that person. How could we stop him? Mm -hmm. All those guys have the same thing in common. You look at Hall of Fame. When you say my name, that has what the coaches think. And mm -hmm. then I look at I look at the returners that's, you know, in my category I potentially being Hall of Famers too, which are great returners that, that put it down. But mm -hmm. but Chris, right? you had the ice them. We're gonna close those, all right? We're gonna pull ten, we're gonna pick top top ten, best returners of all the time. We should have closed this door. I got a million dollars and I'm right. gonna hook you, hook you up to a lot of tech. These are the stats. Who stats you want? Which one of these stats out of all of you want? Oh, Which I know, man. Oh, I, I, I know. I'm a stat guy. I, 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 I believe as long as they keep in the numbers, right. then you, they're important. You ten returners right now that's battling for the Hall of Fame. Here come the top ten with the stats right here. You pick the one you want, mm -hmm. and be be here. You tell right, it's not even close. Me, I'm right here. I'm gonna tell you. How many of those you think gonna pick my stat? How many of you think of those guys gonna pick my career? Oh, I want this seat right here. Who else? I don't even want to see the name. I just want that stats right there. Right. And that's just been And Devin, it's, it's not only the stats. There's a thing called the mm -hmm. eye test. And there's a thing called what did the scouting port exactly. report say? And every time. You play against a team that has Devin Hester. You say, we can't let him beat us. 
And that's the same way they do with Barry Sanders, same way they do with Michael Irvin, same way they do it with Deion Sanders. The same, they do it the same way. Randy Moss, we can't let this guy beat us. And then I, I had an opportunity, like you said, you mentioned earlier in the conversation, the um, top, top 100 players all the time, right? When we mm-hmm. had our ceremony and was giving out the jackets and everything, the table I set up, I sat at a table of probably the best at their position. I sat at a table with them. Mm-hmm. They looked at me, right? They said, wow. They said, young boy, you really don't know where you at right now. You really don't know what's going on. You yeah. really, is, you still wet behind the ears. You don't understand this right here, where we at. Everybody in this room mm-hmm. is a Hall of Fame. You not even ask for yet. You know how special that is. You don't know how special Amazing. you're not even eligible yet. But you in this room. He said, Yeah. Over 200 more people out there watching our Hall of Fame. Not in this room right here. Over 200 more people yeah. are out there watching Absolutely. right now. That's not even, that's a Hall of Fame. That's not in this room. You in here. You're not a Hall of Fame. You got two more years to be eligible, to be listed as on the, on the list for Hall of Fame. Like, bro, this jacket right here. I would take this jacket over that Hall of Fame jacket. I would take this jacket right over that Hall of Fame. To be listed as one of the top 100 players of the NFL all the whole time, all the time. That, yeah, of course. Make that Hall you of Fame should. jacket look small, man. Bless, man. Your time coming to get both of them. Stay, stay humble, stay out of trouble, and watch what God do. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of staying humble, you always talked about some of the things, the youth centers, um, the Boys and Girls Club in South Florida, um, youth coaches and everything you, you, that, that really had an impact on you. You talk about having an impact on your son and their friends by being um, a youth coach in the area right. where you live. Talk about some of the charities and, and some of the things you've been involved in, not only in pro football, but currently, what are some of the things that you're doing now outside of your coaching responsibility and being a great Man, dad? I, to be honest, I kind of backed away from the charity event because I do it out of heart. I don't want no attention. Mm-hmm. Things I understand I, that. A lot of athletes do I that. Do, I don't mm-hmm. want no attention. It's coming out of here. It's coming out of here. Well, what we need? Mm-hmm. I've been blessed, you know what I mean? Fortunate enough where my kids understand, mm-hmm. right? They understand that in the, the, the league that we play in, it's majority the rough side, right? So they don't have a lot, right? So I do it because I love it and I know where it came from. And I, what I try to do is I try to encourage my kids and teach them. You know what I mean? This is where we go every night and lay our head. I go pick up kids, drink. Go ice them because you use the bathroom so you can see where I come from. Mm. That's deep. Mm-hmm. I tell my son, go. I drop it's one. Important. I drink. Go use the bathroom. Go ice them because you use the bathroom because I want you to see how they live. How I live. Right? So, Because I want you to be humble and grateful of your opportunity of where you at right now. So go, go use the bathroom. Go look in their room. When you see a nail and you see a sheet covering the window, you go in there and see where they, they take a shower at, where they, where they use the bathroom at, how it look in there. Go look. That kid. So don't never look down on nobody. Never feel like you're better than anybody because you stay in a better house or you drive a better car. Because no. this, this is where we come This is where daddy come from. Everything, we, everything my team need, Team, y'all come up with what y'all can come up with, and I'm gonna come up with the rest. That's how I operate. So when the charity events and, and the posting, you see a lot of these guys giving stuff and giving back to the community. And he wrote this check. He wrote. It. I write a check mm-hmm. every day. Right. Team mom, before, mm-hmm. right, team mom. He gonna two three hundred. Right. Go get some pizza. We ain't got no helmet. Here, go to this. Go to the sports good. Every day. 
Yeah. How right. much you need? How much? Who ain't got mouthpiece? Bonds full of mouthpiece every week. Who ain't got cleats? You ain't got no cleats? Who ain't got no socks? Like, I don't like my kids. But listen, tears come down my eyes when I see my kids get them. My teammates get them. The kids get in the car and they don't have no socks for practice. Don't have a jersey to put on when they show the pad. Come on, man. Let's go to Dick's right quick. No, no, no. Let's go to Dick's. Before I take them home, y'all, any one of y'all hungry? Come on, let's stop by Chick fil A. That's my chair event because I do it from the heart. That's what I do. That's what That's I do. That's all for And Devin, to, to, and, and Devin to, to wrap it up, if you had two minutes, I want I want you just to talk about football, man. What it's meant to you, what it's taught you. Why don't you take like two minutes? Because I know the game's meant a lot to you, and I don't know where your life would be without it, a right. lot like myself. And I've seen you. You're like a gym rat. You love working out. You love staying in shape. All those things. But what does football personally, personally mean to Devin Hester? Football, man, I was able to watch a, a movie this week, right? Man, over my eyes. Willy Wonka, the chocolate factory. Those kids, when they had their five golden tickets and how hard they was trying to get them. But that one that got it, that didn't have it, like the rest of them with some of them parents, had millions of dollars, so they went in the store and every every store in town and bought all the candy where that one got it. And he went to the house and somebody wanted to buy it from him. And he was in a struggling house. And the mother and the, and the grandfather, they was all like, hey, let's sell it. Let's get the money. And that one grandfather said, listen, it's only five of these tickets in the whole world. Money can't buy what the experience we finna get by going to this chocolate factory. That's how football was to me. One golden ticket. Mm. That just fulfilled and all everything that I experienced growing up. Wow. Golden ticket. Well, to a guy drafted 57th, been through a lot of ups and downs. And like all the legendary players told you two years ago, you're not even eligible for the Hall of Fame. You're already on the all-century team. And I believe soon to be get a gold jacket to go in the same closet as that other jacket. One of the greatest football players ever. A guy who never, ever wanted to play wide receiver. Devin Hester. Devin, thank you, man. That was awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot for having me, man. Special thanks to Devin Hester. And thanks for listening to WR1, a Blue Wire podcast presented by WinBet. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Chris Carter, and we'll catch you next week.